Welcome to Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto, the podcast dedicated to focusing on the truth that is always evolving within us and around us, where we explore the potentiality of truth as a highly esteemed value at a time in history when most people have more on their plates than any one human should. If you're new to me, full expression is my jam. Some words people have used to describe me range from speaker, trainer, coach, healer, writer, spiritual advisor, teacher, podcaster, and someone even called me their soul Sherpa once. I'm less concerned with titles or labels and more interested in results, change, and creating a world we want to, can, and are proud to live in. A kinder, gentler, more curious, collaborative, reverent world where people respect each other's backgrounds, experiences, and truths. They trust in themselves, in life, and recognize that we need each other. And they know how to cultivate healthy relationships to true power, not the very unhealthy kind of power our current culture is predicated upon. Speaking of our culture, there's a lot of noise and ignorance in our current culture, and this show aims to cut through that by exploring the truths of a diverse range of incredible voices, from authors, artists, creatives, and educators, to activists, speakers, and those in various scientific and esoteric fields, our guests hail from cultures and countries all over the world. We post a new interview every Monday, and if you want to keep up with the show notes and quotes from our guests, you can follow me on Instagram, at Elizabeth D'Alto. You can expect a wide range of topics when you tune into this show. Everything from health, communication, money, success, parenting, desire, sex, love, and spirituality, to making pivots and transitions in life, and topics related to psychology, storytelling, gender and race issues, emotional intelligence, activism, advocacy, and much more. A few disclaimers, no episode of the show is meant for everyone, and every episode is meant for whoever needs it on the right day at the right time. Not all guest views will reflect my own, and that's intentional. We don't learn, grow, heal, or improve by staying in our comfortable bubbles with all of our people who look, think, or live exactly how we do. If you love what you hear and find it useful and inspiring, the best way to show your appreciation is to share the episode, subscribe to the show, and leave us a rating and review wherever you listen in from. Thank you so, so much for being here with me. Here we go. Welcome to episode number 293 of Truth Telling with Elizabeth Dialto. And y'all, this is my new favorite interview of all time, period. I had a feeling it might be, as today's guest is the author of a book that completely changed my life last year. The book is called Deeper Dating, and the author is Ken Page. I waited to have him on the show for a few months so I could implement what I learned from the book when I read it in the summer of 2018. I also recommended it to several friends and clients and have been geeking out on it for months now. So I could gush on, but truly, I hope you enjoy this as much as I did and listen to it several times over. Ken's big truth was around hidden arrogance when in conflict. From there, we talked about intimacy as a journey of rupture and repair, learning about the humble act of messing up, how he came to discover the content in the deeper dating book and his work with clients as a therapist and his perspective on codependency. Then we talked about my favorite concept in the book, attractions of inspiration and attractions of deprivation, AKA why we get turned on by things that aren't good for us and how to shift away from that to being turned on by what is good for us, which is completely game changing. We talked about emotional availability and finally, finally, he gave me alternative language to use instead of saying masculine and feminine, which is instrumentality versus expressiveness. And you got to listen to the episode for the context on that to see how we apply it. We also bumped into one of my own biggest wounds during this conversation that comes up in my romantic relationship. So I even had a little cry right in the middle of the interview. So like I said, this is my favorite interview of all time. Enjoy this, share it up, tell your friends review it, get the deeper dating book. And I hope you find me on Instagram and tell me everything you felt, everything you thought, everything that came up for you after you listen. This is episode number 293. So links to everything we talked about are over at the show notes page, which is at untameyourself.com forward slash 293. And as a reminder, if you're not on our weekly email notification list to get the show notes and the resources and the links conveniently sent to you, You can get on that list by going to wildsoulmovement.com forward slash podcast. All right, I'm going to shut up so you can get to listening to 
my favorite episode of all time. Y'all, this is long anticipated. Many of you who listen to the show have heard me reference this man and his book, and we finally have Ken Page, author of Deeper Dating, with us today. Hi, Ken. Hey, so good to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, the way we've been opening up to just like remind people that embodiment is important and it's a thing is to just ask our guests, how's your body today? How do you feel? What's going on? Mm. <laughs> well, let me just take about half an hour and kind of describe all my experiences <laughs> from the tip of my toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know how people do that in workshops yes, sometimes yes. and you're like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am familiar. No, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, let me take a minute and see. I feel peaceful and I feel a little bit nervous. Mm. I feel uh, love. I feel super happy to be here with you. I have a great feeling about you as I had before we met. And um I have a nice flow of energy combined with some anxiety. Cool. Yeah. I love all the different honest responses we get from this question too. Sometimes people are like, ah, my neck hurts a little bit. And I'm like, great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the next question, which I, I know I sent you ahead of time because I like to give people a chance to think about this if they want to, is what is a truth that's having a big impact on your life right now? Oh, um, I would say it is a kind of uh, hidden arrogance in me when I'm in conflict mm. because I just had a very difficult interaction with my teenage son who um, I was, I thought, being the wonderful dad, the firm but wonderful dad, and he was deeply hurt by what I did. Mm. And I just felt like, oh, he's such a teenager. But he was so hurt that I finally like got a little bit of humility and went to him and said, how did I hurt you? And he told me, and my heart and my world and my understanding opened up, and I would have completely missed it. So that's my realization is how unconscious and kind of arrogant I can become in the presence of conflict and what a joy it is to stop and say, tell me, I don't want to hurt you. You know what I love about this so much? And, and I love the divine timing. This always freaking happens, the synchronicity. At the time that we're recording this, it's a couple weeks ahead of when it will air. Um, I've been having some conversations online, specifically on my personal Facebook page, about you know some male leaders in this like overall industry, thought leaders, self-help, personal development, um, who are really incongruent. And, and the big piece that I've been drawing attention to, it's not about taking people down, it's not about shaming people, but it is about like that time's up and, and accountability. And I yeah. love that you took accountability for the impact and you were able to take that pause and go, I hurt you. Like, even if you didn't mean to, like we talk about this a lot on the show, intent versus impact. Yeah, even though I thought he was nuts and I was just going to do this because they were his feelings and I wanted to make space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that and that was the arrogance. I was so sure I was right. I was so sure. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I think that that act, you know, they say in intimacy is a journey of rupture and repair. Oh, that's beautiful. And uh, the repair is so beautiful when it happens and so important. And if it's not there on a regular basis, then the love degrades. Yeah. Um, how is it? This is going to be like a big question. <laughs> Answer it however you want. Go as deep or as wide as you feel like. How did you come to be a person who can do repair? By my pain. Mm. By the heartbreak of brokenness and how much that hurt me and bothered me and troubled me and kept me up at night in a million different ways, in a million different zones. The story of my growth and my teaching is, I guess, really, and I don't think <clears throat> I've ever realized that until this moment like this, has been the story of my, of my learning has been about this humble act of like, I'm fucking up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm missing something. Yeah. You know? And I was chronically single, like badly single and wanting a relationship for decades, decades and decades. And I even remember like 
being in Fire Island with my best friend. We were sitting out and I, I just, we were just sitting out in the yard and I said, do you know anybody that is as like horribly crippled by having to have a particular type as me? Mm. And he said, no, Ken, nobody, <laughs> nobody. <clears throat> and I, and I went on a journey that was a journey of like, I need help. I need mm -hmm. to reconfigure. Mm -hmm. So I guess the great joy has been the pain of having love and connection broken and having that kill me where I said, I got to do something about that. And that's led to all of my changes and that led to my marriage and so many wonderful things, that humble act of saying ouch and admitting the ouch. Yeah, I love this. It's it's deeply simple and dim deeply profound at the same time and such a good mm -hmm. transition into chatting about what's in the book. So. I came to your work by way of my dear friend, Susanna Frioni. And mm. um, what I love about Susanna so much is she is such a – like her podcast, for people listening, Susanna has been on the show twice. You're probably familiar with her already. Her podcast, if you don't listen to it, is called Love, Sex, Desire. And she's just one of my go-to people. I went through a deep healing process after a relationship with um, an extremely emotionally abusive, narcissistic person. And that mm -hmm. was kind of my pivot point into going like exactly what you just said. Uh, like this is all 50-50. I've talked about it a lot on the show and we've talked about narcissism, emotional abuse, gaslighting, all that stuff. But like I was – wildly codependent. I grew up in a household with a lot of relational dysfunction. And so I had to really look at all my own stuff. And when Susanna was reading your book, she's like, babe, you have got to check this out. And the whole premise, I know there's like four main parts. There, I want to specifically dive into like the two that really, really, really lit me up and changed my life. Like, and that's oh, not I an exaggeration. Oh, I love that somebody gets that there are four parts. Yes. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. So glad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, me, um, yeah. but, it, but it opens with talking about you find your gifts in your wounds. Yeah. Yeah. And so however it is that feels like best to summarize that, if you don't mind. Oh, I'd love to. What does that mean? So the way I kind of came to this, apart from my whole life, was like, have you ever been like at a campfire at night and it looks like the fire's almost ended, but there's this like one deep ember that you see mm -hmm. in the darkness? I kept seeing this ember in my work with my clients. And that ember was the places where they felt the most shame were the places I thought they were the most beautiful. Again and again. And I thought what the fuck is this? What is this? And, and that related to my own life because the parts of me that I was the most ashamed of, uh, a tenderness and intensity, a vulnerability, a passion, a truth telling, an, uh, a very intense response to uh, both rupture and repair as I felt it, were the things that I felt crazy for, mm -hmm, ashamed mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. and then plus being gay, you know, and, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, and the shame around all the vulnerability and my eros and all of that. So <clears throat> all of those things were things that I banked and I hid and I protected against. And then that created an environment of anger and irritation and deep shame and self-hate. No wonder I couldn't find a boyfriend. No wonder my friendships didn't work. Um, and at a certain point, I kind of hit bottom with the the kind of thing I described, you know, that kind of pain, seeing the emptiness in my life. I was like in New York City, uh, a club kid um, with an exciting professional life and a vapid, vacuum-like, painful sex and social life and romantic life and friend life. And I realized my life was empty and it was a very painful bottom. And um, I started getting help. And uh, that gaping, gaping, terrible hole of emptiness is what led me to get the help I needed. Mm -hmm. And um, in getting that help, I rediscovered my eight-year-old. I rediscovered my tenderness, my vulnerability, my joy, my silliness, my childlikeness, my girlishness, my boyishness, all those parts of me that just felt way too mortifying. And I began to nurture them. And as I did that, 
all of a sudden I started making like like developing deep friendships. I finally let myself spend time with the people I love. I like left my wild and insane search for love that never ended and never got anywhere. And um and I found that I was starting to become sexually attracted to guys who weren't assholes. And um <laughs> <clears throat> and they were attracted to me. Finally, it was mutual. And uh, that was like kind of the beginning of my world changing and the beginning, the concurrent beginning of my understanding that the parts of ourselves that we kick to the curb because we've been so embarrassed by them are our souls. They're our holiness. They're our magic. They're our masculinity, our femininity. They're our gorgeousness. They're our power. And that when we learn to love those, our world changes. I love this so much. And, and this also, again, like I'm loving the natural transitions that are happening. The part of the book that altered my reality and my whole existence was mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. talk about attractions of deprivation. Oh, baby. Yes. Versus attractions of inspiration. Yeah. Can you please describe both? I will say so much about that. Great. And, um, and at some point before the end of this uh, episode, I would love to teach a process to people that they could do on their own. That yes. is like in so many decades of my work is my number one, most user friendly, delicious, delightful, insightful, powerful, wonderful exercise I know. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Twist my it, arm. <laughs> <laughs> and it connects to this. So, so Great. good, good, good. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I'll use myself as an example. I was always attracted to guys who were cocky, really cocky, like the bad boy type. I love them. In retrospect, I learned that I loved them because they weren't uh, afflicted with the same sensitivity that I felt afflicted by. Um, they turned me on for that reason. So that was my type, these bad boy types. And that's why it never worked. I loved them. I chased them. I got really buff. I got really buff to like get them. Mm. I looked really good and really in shape. And I tried everything. Um, and I was never able to keep them. It never worked. And, and, and I never really necessarily respected them or treasured them in a certain way. So I think they felt disrespected, but they were my turn ons. And that was real. And that was where I felt really flawed, you know, kind of crippled in terms of a type that I just had to be with. Um, and so that was where I was stuck. And I felt like very emotionally immature, but I couldn't help it. That's who I was attracted to. I can relate to this big time. And as you're saying that, like they didn't feel valued either because in a way, and I've noticed this in myself, I have this where it's almost much less, like I still, I have the inclination. I don't go towards it anymore because of your book. Um, it's like this, this acquisition, this like conquest yeah, right. versus right. actually valuing and seeing a full human being. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. You know, I call it the myth of lost love. Mm. And it's this like early, early myth of how we and it comes from how we lost love. And it's this struggle to get it back. But we try to get it back from people who are going to end up wounding us the same yeah. way we're wounded as kids. Yep. Yep. But yeah, yeah, right. Again and again. And um, I so I remember the moment that I had this revelation. I was uh, maybe like 20. 25 years old and I remembered that I maybe I was 30 but I fell in love I remember falling in love in high school with a guy who was straight but he was kind and gentle and wise and he radiated a goodness that blew my world apart and I fell in love with him and I thought wait a minute I don't fall in love with those kind of guys mm. how did I fall Maybe I have a different circuitry. Maybe I have a circuitry where I can fall in love via inspiration instead of deprivation. And that was the beginning of understanding that in a very binary way, there are two kind of attractions that we can have. There's what I call an attraction of deprivation, which is usually sexy and wild and hot and incredibly scratch the itch. And it's the attraction to someone who like almost loves us or almost treats us right, right? 
who kind of maybe they could love us if we lost that five pounds or if we just were a little more this or they could, they could that kind of attraction. If I didn't have feelings. <laughs> if I didn't have feelings, right, right, right. If I didn't if need I to talk about things sometimes. Oh, God, <laughs> if I didn't need to talk about things, right, right, right. If I didn't need so much, yeah. if I, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Or like the whole stream of if I could just explain to them why it's not good to be unkind to me, if I could just explain to them why it's not good to X, Y, and Z. And we can get really lost in those and they trigger something deep. They trigger the place of proving and every one of us knows the agony and the suffering on the planet proving that's the planet of pain. And, um, so it's like that proving thing, if I can just prove. And it's endless, and it's repetitive, and it never really works. But you could stay there forever. And those are attractions of deprivation. And we've all got that circuitry. All of us almost could be attracted to somebody who almost loves us, who we can almost prove ourselves to, mm -hmm. who's almost attracted enough to us. All of us can be. It's empty. It's fool's gold. It itches so bad you have to scratch it. And it's ultimately a path to hell. Uh, it's so true. Can I ask a question here? Yeah. Can someone be both? Or it's like if they're deprivational, they're deprivational. And it's like cool that they're a little inspiring, but ultimately it's deprivational. Oh, yeah. That's a fabulous question. And ultimately we're all both. And um yeah. So maybe let me just talk about the uh, primary colors first yep, yep. and then get into that, Great. you know, uh, graduate course awesome. there in, in these attractions. Yeah. So <clears throat> those are attractions of deprivation. And a lot of us have spent like a lot of years stuck in there. We think it's love. And yeah, me too. Oh, my God. And we don't know we're doing it again and again because all the dating advice is about how to make yourself more attractive. It's not about understanding your attractions. And until we understand the contours of our attractions, we'll do the same patterns again and again. Yeah. And the study of our attractions is one of the richest studies of our beings and our lives and our mission that there is. So not getting into it that deep, just to say that yeah. we also, like all of us, no matter how attracted we are to the bad boys and the bad girls and the bad gender fluid people, um, we also have a circuitry of attractions of inspiration. And that's where we could fall in love with someone because of their goodness, because of their generosity, because of the ways that they look at us and we feel like they're right there looking at us and liking us and loving us and kind of cupping our presence in their hands. And you can fall in love with that, but it's a different kind of falling in love. It's like, it's slower, it's more gradual, it's a little scarier because we have to metabolize bit by bit someone's availability and availability is scary. It's really scary. So um, those are attractions of inspiration and we can cultivate those attractions. And when you make the choice, this existential choice, that you're not going to pursue your attractions of dep deprivation, no matter how sexy they are, when you make that choice, like, and it's like blood and sweat and barbed wire to like get over that and make that choice. But when you make that choice and then you make another choice, which is I'm only going to pursue attractions of inspiration people with whom my soul feels safe mm -hmm. when you change yeah when you change your big first question to am i attracted and is he or she hot to does my soul feel safe with this person when you make that your first question does my soul feel safe does my soul feel good and right with that person when those are your only two effing questions because of course sexual attraction will take care of itself you got to be with someone you're attracted to but that'll take care of itself when those become your questions you reroute your entire relationship journey and those are attractions of inspiration and they're the path to happiness. They're the path to your happy life. Their X marks the spot. They're where you want to build and where you want to dig. And nobody, well, not nobody, but most people don't teach us that journey. 
that journey of making that shift. And it's, it's the best step I know toward a happy future. What I appreciated about this so much, are you familiar with Alison Armstrong and her work? Oh, yeah, sure. I love oh, her I'm work. I'm so glad because I would love your opinion on how her work intersects and integrates with yours. Because as I was reading your book and discovering the stark difference between the attractions of inspiration, the attractions of deprivation, realizing, and this comes back to the thing that you were saying earlier of how our pain is so humbling, realizing that my attractions in my whole life have been highly deprivational and, and beginning to, I will say beginning to, because only in the fall of 2018, and we're recording this for those who might be listening to it later in January of 2019. So I'm really only like four months into like actively only pursuing my attractions of inspiration, right? Like weaning, oh. weaning myself off of attractions of deprivation, but in Alex, and I'd love to hear something about how that is. For yeah. You. I, I will totally yeah. share. Happy to share. But, um, you know, I'm I'm reconsidering some of Alison Armstrong's work that I've studied, which again, longtime listeners have probably read The Queen's Code or checked out The Amazing Development of Men or gone deeper or even just listened to my interview with Alison from a couple of years ago. And I'm going, okay, I still think a lot of this is very relevant. And also some of it is what you said, which I wrote down, that dating advice about making yourself more attraction, uh, more attractive. It's about contorting myself. Like so, the aspect of understanding and her work is very um, heteronormative, um, but a lot of it is about women understanding how men work so they can communicate better and all these things. But there's still an invitation there to like contort myself and go against what inspires me and potentially get hooked into needing to prove. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. This opens up like a whole dimension that yeah. is really exciting that I'm glad I'm going to get to address. Cool. And that is, you know, the, the Jewish Reconstructionist um, movement says that the, the whole religion has to be recreated every generation. And as we understand gender in richer ways, we need to reconstruct our understanding of dating and love and romance and gender and all of that. And so I think that Allison's work is now moving more toward understanding polarities versus gender. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think the world's work needs to, um, needs to move in that direction. I think it's a really, really important thing because, you know, because it is just, um, let me think how I want to talk about this. Um, <clears throat> I want to say that I know so many men who have been just crippled by men's dating advice and so many women who have been crippled by women's dating advice. And I'll tell you how men are told. And I remember this one amazing, lovely, gracious, successful, thoughtful man saying to me, I know I will never be really successful with women because I'm not an alpha male. Mm. And they teach you all this stuff and all of this dating advice for men, how to be the alpha man. And it is such a load of toxic shit. It really is. Your goal is not to be an alpha man. Your goal is to be you. Mm -hmm. There is every other goal will lead to psychic violence against yourself oh. and hence against others. Thank and you for saying same, that. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Because when you suppress your authenticity, you create a vacuum inside and nature abhors a vacuum and that vacuum will be filled with a masochistic situation sooner or later, I promise you, or sadistic, you'll hurt someone else or both. So for women, I have met so many, I will never forget talking to a, a woman friend of mine who's very, very, very accomplished and competent and just had this like huge award come to her and was saying that she didn't want to really rave about it too much on a date because you know all of the material about how like then you're gonna you're not gonna let the man be a man and uh one very famous uh advice giver says women leave your fake balls in the office this makes me want to cry so um you know so so all of these powerful women today hear all of this advice that tells them that they're going to scare off a true man if they're too manly and they can be that at work. 
This is bullshit. It is unadulterated bullshit. And we all need to move away from it. I'm being really, really, really blunt about it because I think it causes a ton of pain. We need to understand it's about polarities. You can call it masculine, feminine. You can call it, what do they call it? In, in academic research, they call it... Um, Anima and animus or something? That's that's Jungian psychology. In, in in a lot of research they're doing about gender roles, they call it um, instrumentality versus expressiveness. Ooh, I love... Oh, Ken, I already loved you. Before we even had this cover, I've been looking... And something I've said so many times in the last two years on the show is, until we have better language, I'll say masculine, feminine. I don't love using genderized terms. Yay, yay, good for you, yeah. And we have it, y'all. This is we a have momentous it, we have occasion. It. And there's a woman named Jessica Maxwell who writes fabulous oh. awesome things at the, in the University of Toronto about sex and uh, all of that. And um, I love her work. I've written about it in Psychology Today. Jessica um, anyway, Maxwell, you said? Jessica Maxwell. Thank you. Uh, oh, my God. I'm so happy. Keep going. Yeah, um, she's fabulous. And uh, she wrote a piece on the secret to a good sex life. And it's like nothing we expected. Uh, oh, God, it's so beautiful. I wrote about that for psychology today. Anyway, she turned me on to all of this research that shows that couples where people are polarized in terms of stereotypical masculine feminine behavior, those relationships are painful. And they don't work as well. The relationships where people can play with, with instrumentality and expressiveness together are the relationships where the sex life is the richest, the couple life is the richest. But it's scary because you got to gulp. you got to swallow. you got to like like we are the guinea pigs of gender exploration. Yeah, so it's yeah. hard to develop your taste in new ways. And, you know, we, we are on the edge of that. But the more old stuff dumbs us down, the harder it's going to be to ever get there. So, um, yeah, I think these concepts apply gorgeously. But the bottom line, you know, the concepts of instrumentality versus expressiveness, the concepts of polarity. But the bottom line is we are shockingly creative beings and when we leave our head and we drop into what we're feeling and sensing and souling in the moment wild stuff comes out that has such influence and power and sexiness and tenderness and when we're brave enough to do that we're going to find a girl inside us a boy inside us a gender fluid being we're going to find angels that are masculine and feminine we're going to find all of this wild stuff and at our own risk we suppress it and in bed in sex the parts of you that want to be expressive and the parts of you that want to be instrumental, you want to be able to play with both of those. So that's what I want to say about all of that. Oh my God, it really, I am overjoyed to have these mm -hmm. different terms. And I'd love, it, would you be able to kind of summarize or define what, because we've had so many, and I, I do, I've, I've had value, but it's like kind of like the stepping stones, right? You don't know what you don't know, and it kind of like lays the foundation. We've had many conversations over the last almost four years here on the show about like masculine and feminine and like those polarities and those qualities. How does she describe instrumental versus instrumentality versus expressiveness? Yeah, and, and actually, I want to stop saying versus. Like they just are two different things. Right. And right, right. not yeah, versus. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, so I don't know that she does. She turned me on to a bunch of research that does. Okay. And I actually, I'll send you the link. There's a piece I wrote for Psychology Today called How Gender Role Stereotypes Are Crippling Modern okay. Love. We'll put it in the show and, notes. Um, beautiful, beautiful. So the research that I read described instrumentality as kind of like leadership, like you're the one that moves the ball forward. Mm. You're the one that does, that I'm says, that like asks, this. that makes happen, that says, I want to do this. Hey, could we try this? Can we do this? Oh. I'd love to do this. Can I do this to you? Uh, you know, can you do this to me? Uh, you know, um, can we build this? Whatever it is, instrumentality, you are instrumental, you act. And expressiveness is that you express. You express. I love that this is touching you so much. I love talking with you so <laughs> it's much. So funny. Like people who watch it, they know this. Like if, if people who are listening who are not You're watching, I'm totally crying. It's fine. I'm having a moment. It's my show. I can do what I want. You know what? I'm I'm you know, I'm starting a podcast and you are becoming my new role model. I wanna be like you. <laughs> I wanna you. be like you. Thank I do. You. It's just what you were saying, the part about 
powerful or strong women or however you want to describe it. That's when I, when I was going through your book and doing the exercises on the wounds, that's clearly one of my biggest, like I have a, my signature program is called power, <laughs> you know, it like uh... helps women explore all kinds of women. Um, you know, what is their power? And, and, and the oh, I love that. that is, is love and truth, you know, like, like you're saying, this is why I'm so aligned with your work because that, that not being able to be fully expressed in a relationship and met and seen and honored and respected there, um, or not have that be so triggering to someone who has their own slew of like traumas and unhealed wounds and insecurities and, and also not being labeled intimidating because of the instrumentality because like yes i got obviously a shitload of both <laughs> you embody both you do you embody you embody instrumentality and expressiveness in your being in your being i feel it i sense it and in a really wonderful way like you are that <laughs> you are quick break in the show everybody to remind you that if you are listening here in real time sometime between february 11th and february 14th 2019 to celebrate Valentine's Week, you can save $185 on a Wild Soul Movement Weekend Workshop. That is right. Instead of $399, you can pay $214, and that is my way of spreading some extra Wild Soul love this week. So head on over to wildsoulmovement.com forward slash workshops, and you can check out all of the remaining dates and locations for 2019, as well use the code VDAY. 214 at checkout and the price will change from $399 to $214 and hopefully I get to see you somewhere in the US, Canada, Australia or the United Kingdom this year. Again that is wildsoulmovement.com forward slash workshops and the code to use at checkout is VDAY, V as in Valentine's Day, DAY 214, VDAY 214. All right y'all back to the show. And it's been, again, like this is why your book was so useful for me because so painful, so painful mm. to be consistently rejected for the things that make me who I am. That's and, exactly it. That's yeah. exactly it. That's the heart and the soul. And to have the awareness that if, if that's <clears throat> happening in the external world, it's because it's happening in my internal landscape as well. Oh, that's so right. And I got to say something about this. Yeah. This is like what I call the deeper physics of dating. And it's this, this is like to me, in my work, in my intensives, in my therapy, in my teaching, you know, working with so many single people, this is the thing that is the closest to like making me, I remember when I first decided that I believed in that there was a God. Mm -hmm. And I remember when that was, I was in the Museum of Natural History. My and favorite I was museum, looking, by the way. Oh, oh, it's such a great museum. And um, I was looking at the mathematical formula that defined the difference in size of each descending chamber of the Nautilus shell. There's a mathematical formula that determines the descending size of each one. And I thought, there's a God. Like, there is a blueprint <laughs> here that is... <laughs> You know, there is there is some kind of a blueprint to this being, to this world. And I feel that when I think about this principle that I'm going to mention now, like there must be a God because this is so benevolent. Mm. And <clears throat> I guess not just benevolent, but challenging, but powerful. And here's what it is. The degree to which you embrace and cherish, not just accept, mm -hmm. but cherish those core gifts to that degree you're going to become sexually attracted and romantically attracted to people who are good for you and who cherish you for who you are and you're going to be more likely to find them in some mysterious way conversely the more you orphan those parts of yourselves or decide that they're up on the auction block and other people get to decide if they're worthy or not, or you suppress them altogether, to that degree you will be sexually and romantically attracted to people who are not good for you and who are not available. It's a miracle. Your sexual attractions, your romantic attractions, and the people you meet will change based on this one phenomenon. It's so amazing. So um, earlier this year, my friend Eva Clay was on the show and she said something that I was like, oh, yes, this is that chemistry is just chemistry. That does not mean someone's good for you. Right, right. That's so true. 
That is absolutely true. And, and go ahead. Oh, just that what you're looking for is a particular kind of inspirational chemistry. And the one question you want to ask is, does my soul feel safe with yeah. this person? Does my soul feel inspired with this person? My husband is a tech guy. He can listen exquisitely to the feelings of the people he loves, but he cannot share a single feeling except mild annoyance <laughs> and love and love and love. But that's it. That's it. But he can listen. But so so I thought I could never be with someone like him in the beginning. But when I was with him, I felt like my soul could take wings. I felt like there, I feel like there's a vast sky and I can fly and I'm still in his hands and his arms and his love. I don't know why that is. I don't know how it is. But my soul feels safe and my soul feels inspired. And if you've got those two qualities and you and you make that your first choice, you will find men, women, anybody who you are sexually and romantically attracted to who have that. And um that's what I want for all of your listeners. And yeah. Viewers. Yeah. Um, and so after I read your book last <clears throat> summer and then I started to pursue more attractions of inspiration, I was still, again, weaning myself off of the deprivation that I had a beautiful at the turn of the year. And then I don't know if you're into astrology at all. And for people listening, whether you are or not, it, it is significant in my own practice and understanding of myself. And my moon is in Capricorn and something about that Capricorn energy in the month of January, um, I was complete. I was complete. There was a specific person wow. who I fell in love with last year. That was such, I, I kept describing him once I had the language from your book as like an absolutely impossible cocktail of inspiration and deprivation. <laughs> I love that. Because it's kind of like you keep saying like sexually and romantically. So like sexually, so inspirational, like transcendent like spiritual mm -hmm. connection experience mm -hmm. um but romantically the absolute most deprivational experience <laughs> so it was such a like and i spent about nine months going back and forth in this but what i appreciated about it was after all that healing time i'd taken after my last relationship all of that happened on my own and so I went into this experience like eyes wide open. I knew yes. damn well a month in that it wasn't good for me, but I needed to have the embodied experience and observe it to, yeah. to let the rubber hit the road on everything yes. that I'd learned from that healing time on my own yeah. and, and be able to like make different choices or make the same choices I used to make, but catch it quicker and go, oh, got it. I'm not doing that anymore. And then like correct course. I love what you're saying because I feel like it gives permission for people to do this in stepping stones. And that's yeah, really yeah. the way it happens. Like once you have that insight, in my experience with the people I work with, you don't immediately find your attraction of inspiration. Yeah. In many cases, you, you have like a learning where it's like halfway. Mm -hmm. or three quarters or two thirds. That's almost always the way it happens. So I love your, your, your articulating that because I think it's like creating a map for people of what happens after yeah. you make that decision. And you said that, like you gave me permission for that because you said that in the book, uh, not, not oh, these good. exact words, but you said like, there will be a transitional period. It's not like just cause you have this awareness. Now you're suddenly going to be yeah, like yeah. full steam attractions of inspiration. Like there will yeah. be, if you've spent your whole life doing one thing, you're not just going right. to like flip a switch more than likely. Maybe some people have that kind of like iron will. I am not one of them. Right, right. Some people could do it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, what's another interesting? Well, so here's a question. How did you? How did you change around that? I, I let this man shatter my heart more deeply than anyone ever has before. Because I, I'm obsessed with this Rumi quote, you have to keep breaking your heart till it opens. And I, I just let myself love this person. Uh, I was like, you know what? Like, this might be my invitation to see if I'm capable of unconditional love. Because I'm very clear that this person is not going to be able to love me back. And it's not. You did it. And I was like, what? Like, I could practice this. 
And and what yeah. does that look like? And then like so we had shifted. We it was clear very upfront that we weren't gonna be able to like be in a relationship. And I was like, cool, like maybe we could be lovers. And like we went back and forth, we took some breaks, we came back to each other. Um I was very conscious about it and I just because I have been through all that pain before in other relationships, I wasn't afraid of pain. And I knew that on the other side of pain is always some kind of growth. So mm. I, I, I'm not a glutton for punishment either. Mm. But I wanted mm. to heal and I know like there's not healing without pain. So I was like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to let this shatter me and I'm going to trust that I will know when I'm done. So in a certain way, you prioritized the love inside of you over the specifics of this deprivational relationship. And that's what saved you. Your love kind of helped you get out of that because your first commitment was to the love inside of you as opposed to getting him to love you. Yes. And this was also in your book, again, going through, there's so many for people listening, just get the friggin' book, deeper dating. Um, there, those so many ex and do the exercises. Don't read past them. Don't skip them about, especially right up in the beginning, digging for where are the wounds? My, oh. my big ass, tender, caring, heart and generosity and capacity for love is one of my big ones. And so I was like, okay. I love it. I love it. I love it. Isn't that amazing? So the wound actually was your vehicle because in, in within, because this is how it is. Every defense we have underneath it is a wound. Every wound we have underneath it is a gift. Mm -hmm. And inside that gift is our greatness, is our deepest soul. So you use your wound, which held your gift. You use that as a vehicle to get you out of this relationship. I love that. And it reminds me of something that I desperately wanted to say a minute ago and I just forgot. Oh, cool. So can you just give me one moment to try Take, to remember please. it? Please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's gone it'll come back it'll come okay. back if we need it i do that all the time yeah so um i want to ask you one more thing and then i want to make sure that we have time for, for exercise. the exercise yeah. yeah so the thing that i want to ask because people because i talked about this so much after my last relationship Anytime we could talk about codependency, people eat it up. Mm, and mm. in your interview with Susanna, this isn't necessarily in your book, but in your interview with Susanna, you actually gave an explanation and a description of codependency that also yeah. brought me to tears. Oh, yes, 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 yes. This is what it is, is that codependency is a core gift of generosity that we have not yet learned how to manage and curate and dignify. It's like generosity that fills us that we haven't been able to learn how to honor. Totally. And you had also said something about also that, but we're, and I think this might relate back to the attractions of inspiration and deprivation, but correct me if I'm wrong. Also where, where the wound happens and the pain recurring is we are consistently extending that generosity to people who can't receive it. That's right. That's right. And here's the deal. If you can't name and treasure and cherish that generosity, you will squander it mm -hmm. and you will use it as a bargaining chip. Yes. And you will, because it's a gift and people know it's a gift. And already probably by that point in your life, many people have known it as a gift and have milked you for it yeah. already. Um, when you learn to honor and dignify your gift, you will make so much better choices. You know, because it's not just sharing your gift. It's having discrimination, too. Yes, yes. And um, I want to talk about the other side of that because I feel like fairly often we are almost having these conversations and positioning ourselves as the um, – I don't want to say superior or better or whatever, but we're looking at it from our side. How can we recognize in ourselves when someone is extending that generosity to us and we are unable to let it in? Ooh, thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, because here is the deal. And um, Arthur Aaron, do you know, Arthur Aaron is a wonderful, I don't know if you know the 36 questions. Yeah. They're like the, th oh, there's a great modern love column on this and great research. It's one of the like great, great pieces of research. It's this guy said, um, I can, we can, we can, uh, we can create love in a laboratory. 
And uh, that's not exactly true, but there are 36 questions he developed that if you go through these questions with someone, the likelihood of you falling in love with him is increased. And they're just 36 questions of like uh, kind of deepening degrees, starting easy of vulnerability and sharing and expressiveness. Mm-hmm. Why did I mention that? Oh, yeah. Arthur Aaron was the researcher who uh, kind of said this to me in a conversation. He said, if you're someone who historically has not been able to love and value yourself, when someone loves and values you, you're going to be more likely to want to flee them, to want to get away. And this is the thing that I call the wave. And it is, I believe, the greatest saboteur of healthy love that exists on the planet. And I know that it is exactly what kept me single for decades of my life. And this is what it is. Someone comes to you with that generosity and you feel like, ugh. You feel like, oh, oh. Like, um, oh, God, they're like not really as attractive as I thought they were. Or Mm -hmm. um, I don't like this or I don't like that. Or they're too short or they're too tall. Oh, that laugh. Or, oh, I remember that really hot person I was with. Whatever it is that your mind does to get you out of Dodge, because what's happening is your soul is finally at risk. Because if this person sees you and touches you and then doesn't love you, That's like annihilation because you know that they're really generous and they're really available. So our psyches unconsciously make us turned off to those people or at least like we're uncomfortable with that generosity. And here's what I want to say to everybody who relates to that. I want to say two things around the generosity. You can't just change this. You have to in homeopathic drop by drop steps learn to develop a taste for being given to. It's a slow process, it's a beautiful process, but it doesn't happen automatically and it doesn't happen easily. And if you're somebody who experiences this other thing that I call the wave, which is like when someone, when you find that someone is actually decent, available, and interested, that all of a sudden they become like 50 times more boring to you. (laughs) (laughs) This happened to me recently. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Then, then, then a part of you should celebrate because you probably just found somebody available. And here's what you do. I'll tell you the two things you don't do, which comprise what you do do. The two things you don't do are you don't run. You do not get out of Dodge. The other thing you don't do is push yourself to be more any, any, any more intimate than you want to be. Mm. You give yourself space. You allow air to pass because your psyche is terrified. And if there's no breathing room, you will feel suffocated, which is the primal fear. Mm. One of the primal fears inherent in this. So you give yourself space like the next date is not going to be a romantic dinner. It's going to be a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be dinner at one of your houses. It's going to be going to the movies and holding hands and then separating afterwards. Mm -hmm. You give yourself space to breathe. The other thing you do is you don't disdain yourself and you don't force yourself to do what you can't do, but you make up dates where you, you like notice, well, what do I like about this person? Where am I? Like, I like that this person likes dogs. So we'll go out on a date and we'll play with our dogs or, um, whatever whatever that you like about them. You let yourself kind of fetishize that, appreciate that, enjoy it, get a kick out of it. But you give yourself space and you don't flee. And a miracle is going to happen in almost all cases. The wave will pass. Like this horrible fever of get me the fuck out of here. (laughs) Is going to pass. It'll pass. And when it passes, your feelings will come back in almost every case. And with it, a clearer sense of if this person is right for you or not. Mm -hmm. And nobody told me this. And that's why it took me until I was 40 years old before I could sustain anything. Because nobody taught me what the fuck you do when this wave comes. But I've been in rooms of big rooms of people. And almost always (laughs) over half of the people raise their hand if I say, do you relate to this? Yeah, yeah. I had this recently. I was dating someone... He was a gift. I love that thing. It's like a little cheesy, but like some people come into your lives for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. Yeah. He was super available, super healthy, very generous, and I got to practice my deeper dating. Um, mm. Attraction of inspiration for sure, and but ultimately just like not for me, but I got to ride out the wave 
Yes. And then also, but then, then it came again and I'm like, this isn't a wave. This yes. is actually just like, I don't want to be with this person. But right. it was, it was funny. But I, I laugh because this was the first person I had felt bored with. Yes. You rode that white water of boredom. I rode yes, the white water of boredom. Which is really terror. It's really terror underneath. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. God, I went through with this with my husband for like a long time. A oh, really cool. long time. I wanted to ask that. A wave, what's... What's the range of time on a wave? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, if you do these tools and it doesn't go away, then you probably really feel the way you feel. Yeah. Um, or, or it's more serious trauma that you have to you know, deal with as trauma. Mm-hmm. But um, I would say, like, if you do these things <clears throat> and it remains for a few weeks, that's a real warning sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you need to be ready for is, like, for example, I had finally gotten through the wave with Greg. Finally. It was like a year. It's like, oh, shit, I feel nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then, you know, a week later, oh, my God, my feelings are back. It was just terrifying. It was really terrifying. Mm. Um, but it went away. It finally went away until he said... I'm buying a new house that's going to have room for you and your son in it. So we continue this process. And all of a sudden, I just felt sick to my stomach. (laughs) I just felt so get me out of here. And that was the wave. And it went away. It went away. But that one lasted for a while. So in other words, when a big new step comes that scares you, you might get the wave back again. Okay, that's very, very helpful. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm real as you're saying that, I'm just realizing and I'll throw it out just for some context for others if they're relating. I never part of what was happening for me with this man was that I was never actually having feelings. Mm, I was just like yeah, very so. neutral. There was like one time after we hung out I was like, "Oh, I think I'm actually starting to feel something." And then like it dissipated almost just yeah. as quickly as it arrived. So it wasn't, I was like, nah. And I kept checking in. I'm like, is this a wave? Is this a wave? Is this a wave? I was talking to Susanna. Is this a wave? It's just like, no. Nah. So, you okay. were like one of the like favorite like interviewers I've ever had in my career. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. You really, really are. And then the things you say like bring me to like, oh, right. That's this urgent thing that I want to say. So if I could, before we do the exercise, yeah. could I share one more urgent please, please. thought? Um, okay. So... I just think how to put this into words. Okay. So if you experience the wave, if the wave hits you and you think, I got to get out of this wave, there's something really important that, that you really should know. You do not have to be with anybody you're not attracted to mm-hmm. just because they're good for you. Mm-hmm. You do not have to. If just because they're glorious and gorgeous and wonderful – if ultimately, as you've described, the feelings don't come, you are not obligated to be with them. It is not an emotional, sexual immaturity. It's just who you are, and you got to give yourself a break. Yeah. you got to be attracted. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to share that, too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. The moment we've all been waiting for. What is this process, please? Oh, my God. I love this process so much. Okay. So I found this process... Uh, it was a kind of compilation of like lots of different pieces of work, Stephen Gallegos's work and Gestalt therapy work. And um, I found it because I was in a situation where I was offered, um, I was, I was a graduate student at, Col- no, I was postgraduate at Columbia university. And for a lot of different reasons, they screwed up on something and to make up for it, they, they said to me, you can create a conference on anything you want here at Columbia, Ooh. anything you want, it's yours. And I was young and it felt like way over my head, but thrilling beyond words. And I thought I need to invoke a me that could handle this because I cannot handle this. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So I thought like, okay, let me picture a me that could do this because this me, this like disheveled little me ain't never going to be able to do it. Like that's how I felt. And, um, so I pictured this me and it was a, it was just beautiful, this me. It was so great. It was such a great me. It was a me who was like well-dressed, well put together, um, put together. But when you looked into his eyes, nothing stuck. You could just fall forever. Mm. There was no attachment. There was no holding. There was like, like a, some kind of combination of holding rigor 
and being completely like letting the wind take things. And um, that was not me, but it was me. It was the me I was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And I used that me and it gave me really good advice. And then for the next 30 years, I avoided that me mm. because I felt unworthy. For 30 years, I did not do this exercise. 30 effing years. It scared me so much. Mm. And then um, my dad passed away. That was a whole amazing, beautiful experience. But after he, no, before he died, but close to that time, I said, I'm going to try this exercise again. I am going to try it. Maybe I could do it. And I, I didn't feel worthy of that guy is what it was for 30 years. And I did it and it worked. And now I do it every day of my life. Mm. And here's what it is. You picture and I'm going to guide everybody in it. Cool. And it's fast. It's really fast. And it's really sweet. And the best part of it is you completely bypass your inner critical voice. That, which is like, you know, I'm not very good at doing that. But this time I get to do, I get to do with this exercise every single time. So you picture the you you're meant to be. And then you, it's like method acting where you, you know, in method acting, you don't like try to think, how would I be if I was uh, going to be like a, an 80 year old gangster? You just become it. You like jump in there and become it. So it's like that. You imagine you are that you, you don't earn it. You don't do anything. You just imagine you're that you. And then you look at the you of today, of right now, and you call out wisdom to that you of today. You call out guidance. You think of from this beautiful place what you most want to say to that you. Mm. And then you've got marching orders from an inner wise person. And if you love those orders, you don't have to follow them perfectly, but if you love them, you will begin to change and become closer every day to that being. So it's just fabulous and it's easy and it's quick. And it is a source of wisdom that is readily available. It's like it's like the Sahara Desert with the sun beating down, but there's no solar collectors. Mm -hmm. That's our lives without doing this kind of process. So we're going to create a solar collector right now. So, okay, so if you could just close your eyes. And I just want you to picture a moment in your life when you have felt comfortable in your own skin and connected to your own beautiful heart. A time that you've been flowing, felt flowing as you, that your heart was open and you felt good and you felt safe. Maybe a few times. And you could just let these brief memories come. You don't have to remember them perfectly. They can be droplets. Just remember what that felt like. And now I want you to imagine a you that lives that way. You don't have to be her or him. You don't have to be that person. You don't have to earn it. Just picture it, imagine it, fantasize a you that lives with that place, in that place. A you that is past all the glass ceilings that you have inside of yourself. Like the you that you know you're meant to be. Just picture that you. Imagine what his or her face looks like. Imagine what your eyes look like. Imagine what it's like to be behind those eyes and in that body and in that skin. Just, just imagine. The you that you are meant to be, like a, an older, wiser, maybe not even older, but a more evolved version of you. It's like the angel you. It's like the you, you. And now, just imagine that you jump into her skin or his skin. You become that you. Don't work. Don't strive. Don't try. Just pretend. It's a pretend game. And what it's like to be in this gorgeous flow of you, flow of you, heart open, comfortable in your own skin, just radiant, just beautiful, just you, pure you. And now I want you to imagine the you of today standing in front of you and look at her, look at him. And from this place, what do you most want to say? 
Think of what you most want to tell. What are the directions you want to call out for right now to her or him? And now open your arms and let her or him come into your arms. And just hold this struggling, beautiful, precious, aspiring you of today in your arms. Okay. And now hold that together because you can come back to this person a hundred times a day whenever you want. Slowly open your eyes. I love her. Yeah, she's you. Super fun. And so if you're on a subway, on a bus, walking down the street, um, having a question, having a dilemma, having a date, you can take literally like two seconds. Remember this person. Become her. Don't think what would she say. Actually, like go in her skin and think what do I want to say to the, you know, the me of today. And whatever it's going to be, it's going to be pure wisdom. And if you do that every day, I take my cell phone and I have a thing that says notes from higher self. And I talk it into my phone after I do this exercise. And those become my daily meditation for the day. And what you find is that if you do this every day and you just like love the message, you don't have to do it anywhere near perfectly. You just have to love it. Every day you will move closer to being that gal or that guy that you I love this so much. We do. And it's the we're, best. we're wrapping up here. I, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do a similar, I call it like the future self, uh, guided yes. visualization, but here's the distinction. What was this process that you just walked us through was more powerful was the get in their skin. In get the in one the I've always guided, I've stayed, I've kept, I've stayed and I've kept us, the people I'm guiding in the current self skin right 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 in. that it makes a huge difference it does it really does i actually have a whole podcast episode that's coming oh, out cool. about this and yeah so it's like because then you get to really like have a felt sense of the deliciousness of your your full being yes Did which you're... we all get to experience all the time from your podcast right Thank and you. your presence in your teaching does your forthcoming podcast have a name Yes, the Deeper Dating It'll Podcast. It'll be called the Deeper Dating Podcast. Yes, I can't yes. wait. Fun Can fact. I have you on? Yeah, hell yeah. Um, okay. I don't, I don't listen to a lot of other podcasts, which is the irony of me having podcasts. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna be listening to your podcast. You are amazing. I am so grateful. I thank you so much. This is easily and instantly one of my favorite interviews of all time. And this is gonna Vice be versa. episode like 290 something. So, oh, uh, thank you. Um, is the website deeperdating.com? Yes, that's the website. All right, everyone can find you. And are you, is there anywhere on social media that you prefer to be, or is that not really your gig? Um, I'm on Twitter, but usually I'm saying things about children being separated at the border and the yeah. horrifying qualities of this administration. So yeah. it's a little bit political. I'm a little political on Twitter. Um, but you can find me on Twitter, and uh, I need to get more active on all of the social media, but I'm on Facebook too. Okay, cool. And you can read Tons of articles of mine on psychologytoday.com. I'm going to, I'm literally going to go geek out on all things campage after this. Thank mm -hmm. you so, so much. Everyone listening, this is one of those episodes that you're going to want to listen to anywhere from twice to like 27 times. Mm -hmm. Share with your friends and family, your loved ones. Use this as a discussion point. This is, this is universal stuff. And that's the last thing I want to say that I love, love about your book so much. I'll get messages. Obviously, the audience is predominantly women or female identifying. Um, but we do have men who listen and I'll get DMs. Yay, you men. Yeah, and I'll get DMs and they'll be like, do you have anything for the guys? And I just literally like three days ago recommended your book. I was like, this book is for everyone. It's literally for everyone. doesn't matter yeah. your gender, how you identify, who you love. How, like this is the one. And it's literally the only one I've encountered like that. So just again, thank you for that. This was This was a very important – interview, not just for like the show and the people listening, but literally for me, for my own life, I'm going to listen 27 times. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Ken. We'll see you later. Beautiful. Thank you. We're all so different and, and we are all called to a different kind of love and a different kind of service in the world. You know, like I could not do the work 
that Delia and Andy do. That's not my work to do. But I was thinking about how it could inform the work that I do. And one of the things that I appreciated so much about them that I was so inspired by, I was like, oh my goodness, these are. These are the earth angels that I was praying for earlier today because my friend Phil actually asked them. His question was, you know, my heart, I'm hearing these and I'm wanting to keep my heart open And um, because they did, they they told us several stories that were very hard to hear of, you know, how these children are abused and traumatized. And um, he's like, how do you not shut down? How do you go be with? How do you go be in these spaces? 